Well, hello, and thank you for joining us this afternoon on Facebook Live. I'm Hank Manitrez from the Pentagon at the headquarters, Department of the Army, G1. Today, our primary discussion will focus on a very important topic, the largest change to the non-commissioned officer corps in 50 years, the enlisted centralized selection board process. Signed by the Secretary of the Army just last month, the Army will implement this over the next three years. It's a talent management effort that serves as a catalyst to evolve from uh, time-based promotions to merit-based promotions. An added benefit is it will improve readiness, leader and professional development, and the professionalism of our non-commissioned officer corps. As our panel members will discuss it, it will affect decisions on promotions, assignments, retention, and it will maximize the potential of the Army's greatest asset, our people. We'll have more plenty in-depth discussion on this over the next hour. And we'll have some good dialogue with our participants on the U.S. Army Facebook Live feed. Right now, let's introduce our panel members. Our first guest really needs no introduction. We have the 15th Sergeant Major of the Army, SMA Daniel Daly, whose leadership and vision have been instrumental in helping shape this policy. As I'm sure everyone is aware, SMA Daly was sworn in as the 15th SMA, January 2015. Throughout his tenure, he has led a number of efforts to improve the quality of life for our soldiers and their families, including this policy. So thank you, SMA, for joining us today. Thank you. Our second panelist is Sergeant Major Mark Clark, who is the Sergeant Major for the Directorate of Military Personnel Management for HQDA Army G1. And he is chiefly responsible for personnel management initiatives that affect the entire enlisted force across all components of the Army. As you can expect, he and his team have done the heavy lifting for developing the key changes in this policy. And these are the first changes to this policy, like I said, in more than 50 years. It's humongous. So thank you for joining us, Sergeant Major Clark. Thank you. Gentlemen, our goal today is to explain the changes in this new Army directive and lay them out so that we get the proper information straight to the field from our senior enlisted leadership. With that said, we can begin by giving you both an opportunity to share your thoughts and discuss the policy changes, and then we'll move into answering questions that have filtered into us here in the studio from our Facebook Live audience. SMA, take it away. Well, thank you. And uh, Sergeant Major Clark, thanks for being with us here today. Thank you for having well, me. Well, as you heard, uh, this is a, a very big change in the Army. Over 50 years of doing our promotion system the same way we have been time and time again. Um, and we didn't change for without good reason. Um, our promotion system has served us well but we can do better. And that was the, the sole reason of why we made these significant changes to the promotion system. We want to change our system from largely a time-based system to a talent-based system. And that's where our promotion system is going today. Many of the changes that we've made in just the past few years led up to and were part of this greater change that we've been planning for some time. Um, Sergeant Major Clark's team, along with the enlisted talent management team, have been working on this for over two years and have put a lot of time and analysis in making sure that this is the right direction to take our non-commissioned officer corps for the future. I can assure you that um, it is the right direction to take our NCO corps, and it will serve this non-commissioned officer corps well, and most importantly, it will compensate and award, reward those who work hard, who are most talented, versus be solely focused on time as a means to promote. There's a lot of uh, things that are to be understood about this, a lot of details. Um, that is forthcoming. There's a very deliberate plan to train and educate the entire non-commissioned officer corps here in the near future, beginning with our most senior sergeants majors in the upcoming Senior Enlisted Training Leader Development Conference in, uh, near Fort Bliss, Texas in June, and also the graduating class of the Sergeant Major Academy before they depart uh, this graduating year. That chain teaching will filter down through the chain of command over the next three years, and which how long it will take us to fully implement this entire process. Um, but we can talk about some of the details and get into the finer details of what the entire process is inside of the questions. Sergeant Major Clark. Thank you, SMA. So two years ago, the Sergeant Major of the Army challenged us to look at why we were doing time-based promotions. And in our analysis, we were able to determine that not only could we improve our promotion system, but we could also use that very same system to inform other decisions as far as who's the best qualified to be trained, who's the best qualified for assignments, and also who's the best qualified to retain. And with that, there are multiple benefits that are associated for the individual soldiers as well as the Army in itself. Through the new centralized uh, evaluation board, soldiers will be more informed. They will be informed on where they stand amongst their peers. They will no longer have to guess where they stand. They will be notified through the Army Career Tracker. They will also be informed by limited 
uh, feedback from the boards on what was positively or negatively affected a board member's vote on their actual uh, board file. The soldiers also have more influence now than what they've had in the past. You now, through your performance potential and your board file that you present to a board can determine how you rack and stack on a or order of merit list within a board. This also will make you more qualified for the most demanding and challenging assignments that we have. The other benefits are more opportunities for soldiers with promotions. Currently, right now, we look at soldiers in zones of considerations with two years time and grade. Soldiers will now be looked at at 18 months time and grade to give them a six month uh, advantage of being looked at earlier so that we can train them to be prepared for the positions in which they're going to uh, go into after they're selected for promotion. Those opportunities are open to all the soldiers from staff sergeant through sergeant major who will be evaluated through this process. But most importantly, this process will improve Army readiness. We will now be able to promote soldiers, assign them, and train them based on them being the best qualified in order to man our forces so that we can be the most lethal Army in the world. Okay, so we look forward to your questions and we appreciate you being online today um, to ask us those questions. All right, gentlemen, thank you. Let's go with our first question. Some soldiers have to wait a year or longer after they've received their sequence numbers. Will the update to the policy prevent extended wait times, allowing you to pin on sooner? Well, I'll address it and I'll go to Sergeant Major Clark for some finer details. So first and foremost, uh, the, the fundamental process of how we evaluate you um, through the board process, which it used to be called a promotion board, in the future will be called an evaluation board, is the same. The non-commissioned officer's career path can, is uh, by MOS is outlined in DA PAM 600-25. That process will remain the same. The first fundamental change is, is how we sequence individuals. Previously, uh, the board members would vote. They would rack and stack individuals based upon the requirements laid out in DA PAM 600-25. And then that sequence, would, they would be resequenced based upon time and service, time and grade. That process will not happen anymore. It will be a true talent-based list. So when the board decides that you're the most talented individual and you've met all the prerequisites for the evaluation of that year, you'll be assessed as the number one person. Then you'll be assigned a number. That number, for the first time in the history of our centralized selection system, will show you how you rated against your peers. It won't be the sequence number, just determine you're the most senior or the most time in service or time in grade. That is your first indication of your performance based upon your peers and your same MOS and skill level. Um, we will uh, assign promotion allocations on a quarterly basis, which will give our non-commissioned officers predictability. So the promotions uh, will still come around the same time to get us exhaust the entire list, because that's our intent, is to promote for the annual requirement, and we will promote based upon requirements, and we can accurately predict those requirements in real time through the new system. Um, so the number, the, the total length of promotions for that annual won't change much, because it's still going to promote throughout that year. Um, the fundamental change that we're doing is we're going to change promote the most talented first. Absolutely. Mr. Clark? And, and just to add to that uh, SMA, mm -hmm. so with the, the new promotion piece, there will no longer be a actual promotion list that we will publish. Mm -hmm. We will now publish a list of all of the fully, qua fully qualified non-commissioned officers in alphabetical order. So there won't be a committed list to where we're committed to promoting someone where you have to wait 12 to 18 months to be promoted. The one thing that is going to help with predictability in time is in the past, we used to set promotion allocations. And when that promotion board is finished and we resequence by time of service, time of grade, we would draw a line within that board. It's called our select object. Sometimes we get that number right. Sometimes we don't. It's all based upon predictability of known losses, retirements, chapters, those kind of things. Um, but it's, sometimes it's off. Sometimes we either have to carry that deficit into the next promotion year or we have to add even more promotions to the next promotion year because we had to wait for the, second, the next year in order to do that. Under this promotion board, we have a fully qualified list and if we need to continue to promote, all we do is keep moving down that list and promote the individuals once they're fully qualified. Because remember, this is not a promotion list, this is an evaluation list. You still must meet all the requirements of STEP to get promoted. That sounds good. It makes total sense to me. Question number two, if everything is based on merits, what or who helps to keep the integrity of the system? And how do we know that leaders are truly advocating for the most highly qualified NCOs as opposed to the most highly liked individuals? Yeah, this is a great question. And a lot of times I hear this out in the field, the perception of inequality inside of a promotion board. Let me tell you, after being uh, a member and a participant in numerous amounts of boards, I can tell you the system is very fair. As I mentioned earlier, DA PAM 600-25 outlines the career path for you and your MOS and skill level. And it clearly says, 
lines out the things that you need to do to be successful within your MOS and your skill level. The board um, must demonstrate their ability to be able to assess packets um, before they can continue on in the board process. So when the board members show up, they're giving a briefing. They review um, the board guidance from myself, the chief staff of the Army, the board president, and they review the requirements in DAPAM 600-25 for the board. Then they are tested by giving a mock board process. Each of them are given files, they must board those files, and they must all board them within a specific range, which we call aberrant of each other. And they cannot continue on with the official board until that is done. So, Major Clark, did you want to clarify anything? Absolutely. Well, in addition, you, the individual hmm. soldier, will know where you are ranked on that OML because you will be notified through Army Career Tracker. And in that notification, when we post a 90-day notification of the OML numbers that we plan to pr promote, you will know if you are within that, that quarterly notification. So unless you are not fully qualified, meaning you have not attended your, uh, your PME, your SLC or your MLC that is needed for promotion, or you are not flagged or barred for reenlistment, you are otherwise qualified and you will be promoted in the order that you are on the OML. So you as an individual soldier have the ability to track to ensure that you are being promoted in the order of merit. Yeah. And additionally, there's a bunch of processes within the board process to keep it fair. Like when board members are reviewing packets, none of them are reviewing packets at the same time in the same packet and not even in the same order. So it doesn't go from one board member to the next. It's random. They each sit behind their own computer systems. They are evaluating based upon the established standards that are outlined by the board president and they are continuously throughout the board process assessed on the ability to give fair assessment to each and every packet on an individual basis. What I remind non-commissioned officers all the time is if you want to know what you have to do to get promoted it's in BAPAM 600-25. It is updated on an annual basis by your proponent and it is relevant to what the Army needs in that MOS and skill level. Well, earlier, SME, you were talking about promoting based on allocations and requirements. So how will HRC balance out fully qualified NCOs against the promotion demand that's out there? What happens when there's a, a low demand but thousands of fully qualified NCOs? Well, I'll go to Sergeant Major Clark since he's the subject matter expert on personnel management. So within the new NCO evaluation board process, we were able to combine our QMP and our QSP process, our qualitative service program and our qualitative management program. So if there is a a concern of a stagnation within an MOS, we will take the OML and we will start from the bottom from the not fully qualified and we will be able to separate those individuals from the military and from the fully qualified. If they are within good standings, we can also reclassify them to make room in certain military occupational specialties so that we can continue to have promotions and growth within those CMFs. Yeah, and so important to note is, as Sergeant Major Clark said, in the past, we did several boards to help manage the force, either through promotion or selection criteria or quality management. Um, now, we we're calling this a multi-use board. So each skill level um, will be evaluated each year and everybody will be eligible for that same board. And when you're assessed, you'll be assessed as fully qualified or not fully qualified. Those individuals who are not fully qualified may receive notification that they're at risk for administrative um, separation from the Army, especially if they get assessed for a second year, and the second year they're still unfully qualified. So this board allows us um, to cut down on the number of promotion boards we do a year, and it allows a single look by one group to equally measure the performance of each non-commissioned officer within that, that evaluated pool. Excellent. Well, certainly everything we do in the Army and in the personnel world is tied to readiness, and you've mentioned already that this will enhance our readiness. Love for the both of you to chime in and sort of expand on that a little bit and how this really does affect readiness and improve it. Yeah, absolutely. And many non-commissioned officers that have been through the promotion system in the past, you can all remember that uh, sometimes you'll wait on a promotion list for some time and, and you realize that why your promotion number was so high, your sequence number was so high. Well, honestly, it's because it was based upon your time in service, time in grade, regardless of how you fell out on your performance on the board, so how the board rated you. We took a look at that and we said we wanted to reward talent. Talent based promotions is the, is the direction we wanted to go. Um, every non-commissioned officer in this promotion system will still have to meet the time and service time requirements to, com to be eligible for that evaluation board. But once the board is complete and once the board members have reviewed and assessed everyone in that pool, it will be true talent that um, depicts your, your, uh, your number. And if you're number one on the list, you'll be offered an opportunity to go to school first and when you complete that uh, training and meet all the requirements for promotion, and there is a requirement for promotion in your skill level in MOS, 
you will be given that promotion. And that's how the, simply how the new system is going to work. That is going to build readiness because it rewards the most talented individual. It rewards those people who are working hard to do the things that the Army needs them to do. And that's most important. We have requirements in the Army. We have authorizations in the Army. And they change all the time. And this is an evolving and a changing and adapting Army. And that's why we have to change the promotion system to meet those demands. Absolutely, yes, sir, man. With our current process that we have now, it takes us two years to grow a Sergeant First Class and a Master Sergeant and three years for a Sergeant Major. With the new NCO evaluation board process, we will be able to meet emerging requirements in the time that we need them. If a new requirement is identified after a board has been processed, currently we would have to wait till the next board in order to promote or select someone to fill those requirements. With a standing on mail, we can simply move down to the next qualified or the best qualified non-commissioned officer who is fully trained and fully eligible to be promoted to promote them to those requirements, thus giving an opportunity for soldiers to be promoted faster versus waiting for the board the next year. Yeah, so, you, so like now when we're growing the Army, I mean, under our old system, if, if I said, hey, we need to add this many Sergeant First Classes or Master Sergeants, we had to wait for the next board cycle? Absolutely. But under this new one, I won't have to. We will be able to use the standing on mail that we have to promote to those requirements now. And just keep moving down the list by the most talented people to fill those authorizations. Absolutely. Excellent. Our next question from the field. How soon does the notification process begin for selected NCOs? Sorry, Major. So, uh, similar to the current process that we have, once a board uh, is approved and the list is actually published to the field in alphabetical order with an asterisk notifying who is the best qualified, meaning they had a 5.5 or higher on the board uh, vote by the board members, that list will be published to the field and those individuals will then be scheduled for school. So it's more of a selection for school. So as you go to school, the individuals who become fully qualified for school will be the first individuals that we end up promoting. And there's normally a 30 day time frame from the release of the list to when HRC schools branch can start scheduling individuals for school. All right, Sergeant Major, in, in talking about timelines, we mentioned that we're going to phase this in over the next three years. Can you, can you walk us through the timeline on that? Yeah, absolutely. I'll talk the reasoning and allow Sergeant Major Clark to talk some of the specifics. As you know, this is a big Army, and we've been doing this promotion system. And I've said up front that it has served us well to this point, but we can do better. And we have to phase this in over time to meet the demands and requirements of the Army, first and foremost, and the readiness requirements. And secondly, so we don't hurt any non-commissioned officers. We have current boards that are still in effect, current sequence number and promotion lists that are still in effect, and we have to sequence a lot of other things to make sure that this works and it is implemented over time. So that's why we chose to implement this over a three-year period. Um, and it gives us space. There are a little bit of uh, room in there if we have to make slight left or right adjustments or uh, changes to other policy or procedures to complement the process. And this allows us to do in stride after action reviews, after each board, starting with the most senior and working down. Right, Sergeant Major Clark? Absolutely, SMA. In addition to what the SMA is saying, starting this year, fiscal year 19, we canceled the nominative Sergeant Major Board and the Command Selection Board, and we replaced it with the Sergeant Major Evaluation Board that is gonna take place here in August. In addition, also in May, uh, just, we conducted the Master Sergeant Promotion Board. When that board is released, those individuals will no longer be sequenced based on time and service or time and grade, but they will, they will be sequenced by OML numbers. Also, fiscal year 20, we will start the SAR major evaluation process for those who will be selected for class 71 to go to United States, SAR, SAR major, United States Army SAR major academy. And then in fiscal year 21, November of 20, we will do the master sergeant board where those individuals will use the new NCO evaluation board to be selected. And in February of 2021, we will do the Sergeant First Class Board, where all staff sergeants will be evaluated through the NCO evaluation board for selection to Sergeant First Class for training and also assignments. So if I'm on a current standing list right now and I have a sequence number, am I going to be grandfathered into that? Correct. So the changes for promotions will not take effect until the November 20. Uh, Sergeant First Class Evaluation Board, which is the board we will use to determine who is promoted to Master Sergeant. No, that's good. So I'm safe. As long as I already got promoted and I've already been selected. I'm okay. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> good question, SMA. Mm -hmm. And naturally, the next question, uh, how does this affect the National Guard and Reserve populations? It's a great question and one I receive as I've been traveling around lately. The promotion system for the Army National Guard and Army Reserve is different. And so a lot of those differences are governed by law. So currently, this system does not have a direct effect on their promotion system. 
but the National Guard and the United States Army Reserve are currently exploring opportunities uh, to improve and to make their system uh, more capable of meeting the readiness needs of those two components. Sir Major? Absolutely. The current process that we have right now is specific to Title 10, active component, and AGR. However, as uh, the integrated personnel pay system of the Army comes online, we will be able to implement how we do promotions for TPU soldiers and as well as IMA. Well, that's, I mean, we've heard a lot of talk uh, from you during your road shows and in, and in your uh, presentations at other events and venues, also from the Secretary and the Chief about talent management. So how does this play into the Army's overall scheme of talent management and human capital strategy? Yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, it's rewarding the most talented, and it's not a time-based promotion system. And if you heard Sergeant Major Clark a few times mention IPSA-A, the new integrated personnel pay system that's going to come online, and we filled it with the National Guard first, as a matter of fact. Um, it's going to give us great more capability. And this system has, has been built with that in, in, a, in a mind uh, to, to move forward. When we, when we move in the future, we want to use a whole a lot more things to determine who the most talented is. And not only that, the specific needs of the Army based upon specific requirements of certain positions. It is my goal to eventually get to the, the point where we can reward the most talented individual by promoting them first, getting them to the assignment that the Army needs them in the most, and also the one that they want to go to. I've, had the, I've given the guidance to the team is that, first and foremost, we need to meet the needs of the Army. And we always will meet the needs of the Army. But secondly, we should try to meet the needs of the soldier and the, and the needs of the family. And if we can do all three, that's a win. Now, I don't want to set any false expectations. You always got to go back to number one. You got to meet the needs of the Army first. Absolutely, yes, I mean. So the OML that will be produced from our NCOA evaluation board process will be fed to the IPSA system through a secure mechanism. That coupled with the 25 point profile that will be built into IPSA will not only help HRC man the field, but would also help commanders uh, at the local level be able to do talent management within their organizations. Yeah, so it's gonna give us an ability that we never had before to look at a multitude of things. If you need a specific non commissioned officer with a specific skill set in their Absolutely. file or that's covered in IPSA, we can reach down in and HRC and all the other personnel managers within the Department of the Army system can find specific requirements for specific jobs that we need across the Army. So we have designed this uh, system, this new promotion system, to complement those uh, add-ons and additions as we move into the future. Well, as we talk about talent management, gentlemen, how do you define talent? Will PT, civilian schools, non-commissioned officer education system, and awards play a role in this? I'd say the answer to all that is yes. And what we're trying to do is build, as you've heard in the past, the well-rounded soldier. All that will play a role. Most importantly, readiness. And what do we need to be ready? Deployability. It's going to play a huge role in assessing talent in the future. Your physical fitness. As you all know, we're moving to the, the new ACFT. And we're doing that to increase the readiness of our Army and increase the fitness level of our Army. Um, your non-commissioned officer education schools, the 1059 is changing in the near future, where we're going to enumerate where your class standing is. That was also pre-programmed to complement this new promotion system, a new evaluation system. All those things play a role. As I tell non-commissioned officers, is everything you do throughout your career should and will have an impact on your ability to be evaluated at the highest levels and be open to the opportunities for the first opportunities to be promoted in the future. Right, absolutely, Charmaine? absolutely, SMA. And, and to kind of put it in another way, if you look at how you were evaluated on your uh, non-commissioned officer evaluation reports, those same items are looked at and that information feeds the NCO evaluation board process, which determines how you can rack and stack on the order of merit list. So you doing all those great things with PT, school and education informs us on who's the best qualified individual, which can in turn determine where you can be assigned or when you can be promoted. That's right. And the more information we can give to the selecting board officials, the better we can get at assessing the most talented individuals for the evaluation list. So will the update affect NCOES and will NCOs be able to pin before SLC or MLC? We designed this with NCOES um, to, to, to definitely complement it and here's why. All too often we select individuals for promotion under the new system and then we offer those individuals an opportunity to go to school because you know just a few years ago we instituted what was called STEP, select, mm -hmm. train, educate, promote. And we did that because thousands of non-commissioned officers had not gone through the requisite level of education required for their skill level. And we created the backlog. And at one point it was greater than 50,000 NCOs across the Army. Not good for those individuals, but not good for the readiness of the Army. So what this is Laos going to do, you heard Sergeant Major Clark say that we're going to now look at you 18 months out. 
Now, the perception is going to be that we're going to promote people too fast, and that's not true. The reason why we're doing that is so we can train ahead. Mm -hmm. We want to evaluate you, and we find out that you're the most talented individual. We offer you the training opportunity. And the great thing about this new system is it's not a promotion roster. So I am not, and this team is not bound to owe you a promotion. All right, let's just say, for example, you're number one on the list. We're going to call you. HRC is going to assign you a school slot, and they're going to say, hey, you need to go to school. And if you go to school, and you graduate and you're fully eligible, the first um, requirement we need for promotion will be offered to you. Let's say I'm number two and I get called and said, hey, you need to go to school. And I say, no, I can't go to school right now. We can go to number three. We don't have to wait because we have not assigned you a sequence number. And it's going to allow us to continue to promote farther down that list, I promise you, than we ever had in the past. Because we know from historical means that uh, hundreds of our NCOs every quarter do not attend school. And it's not for operational reasons. It's for individual reasons. And the rest of the promotion list or the rest of the evaluation list should not have to bear the brunt of, of that individual not wanting to go to the requisite level of training. I agree. So the new process will actually put more emphasis on completing your NCOAS because you can think of it as not being selected for promotion anymore, but being selected for school. And in order to go to school and complete school, that's really when you could obtain a promotable status because otherwise you are not fully eligible to be promoted to the next grade without the school. So going to school once you are put on notification is very important because if you fail to complete your NCOS within the first 12 months after being notified that you're eligible to go, you will have to recompete again the very next year for promotion again that's or for evaluation board. And that's important. There's no that's carryovers right. with this process. If you're evaluated this year, that doesn't mean you continue to be evaluated that same. You have to reevaluate each year unless you are offered a promotion and opportunity to go to school. But it's important. Our non-commissioned officers need to go to the level of training requisite to their skill level. Um, and to all too often, there's a backlog created in the system. Many NCOs out there can attest to it because they get frustrated because they can't get a school slot. Well, imagine if a non-commissioned officer is offered a school slot and they don't go. And then they come around two or three months later and they're offered another slot and they don't go. And they fail to show a third or fourth time. We've had some NCOs who have failed to do that seven times. Those are seven school authorizations for one non-commissioned officer um, that could have been given to another NCO. This new system complements our non-commissioned officer professional development system by delivering training on time, ahead of time, and creating opportunities for non-commissioned officers to get promoted and not having them burdened by people who don't want to train. All right, next question from the field online. When will the next Sergeant First Class Board take place? Sergeant Clark. So the next Sergeant First, First Class Board will actually be in June of 2019. So we'll be under the current uh, policy where we will do a normal selection board. However, when the uh, promotion list is released, these soldiers will be released in OML uh, sequence. They will not be time-based. The next Sergeant First Class Board after this one will be February of 21. So we plan a select objective rate of promotions to cover us through fiscal year 21 before we do the first NCOA evaluation board in February of 2021. Okay. I'd like to go back to something we mentioned earlier. We talked about one end of the spectrum, those that have been grandfathered in. But Star Major Clark, I know that in an interview recently, you talked about how uh, millennials might look at this as an opportunity. I'd like for you to talk about that just a little bit. All too often in conversations with young soldiers, they are always looking for ways to utilize their talents to set themselves apart from their peers. In the new NCOA evaluation board process, these soldiers will have the opportunity to be rewarded for their performance and their potential. The better they do, the better chance they have of having a higher OML number, the better opportunity they have to get the most deserving and challenging assignments that they want, the best opportunities they have to be trained ahead of their peers. Um, so for the young millennials, I think this is the type of system that they can thrive in because they understand that there is a reward for the hard work that they put in. SMA, any comment on the millennial population? They're who, are they're who are recruiting right now. Absolutely, and I'm proud of what they're doing and, and exactly what Sergeant Major Clark said. You should not be um, held back because of time and service, time and grade. Obviously, we have prerequisites, and we're going to maintain those, meaning there's a minimum amount of time you need to serve in each grade. We know that in order to build experience. But the analogy I always use is uh, when you get up to the start line and people take off, the person that's given the gold medal is the person that crosses the line first. And that's the way it should be, because if you met all the requirements to be at the starting line, then you should get all the rewards at the finish line. Cool. Well, how will support MOSs compare to combat arms MOSs when those support MOSs may not get the same opportunities? Yeah, go ahead, Sorry. Yeah. So 
when we do the NCO evaluation board process, all support MOSs will be compared against soldiers that are in the same MOS as them. So they will not be compared to combat arm MOSs. They will be compared against their peers. So your competition, you're being racked and stacked against those that you are, or that carry the same MOS as you. So you don't have to worry about being compared to the combat arms when the board members are evaluating your records. Yeah, there's a lot of people that get selected for the board process. They show up and they all get the briefing from the board president. But when it's time to execute, they break down into individual areas of expertise. For example, one of the last boards I sat on was the 11 Bravo SARM First Class Board. And we looked at the MOS of 11 Bravo, 11 Charlie, and some of the 18 series, the Special Operations series. We didn't look at any other MOSs in there because that wasn't the level of expertise for those board members. Um, we select board members based upon their own individual knowledge, skills, and attributes, and they also have to be fully qualified within their skill level in MOS mm -hmm. in order to serve as a board member, right, Sergeant? Absolutely. Well, I would like to uh, just talk a little bit about what we're expecting leaders out there to do in terms of educating and preparing their soldiers right now. I would assume that there uh, are some pitches that you're giving SMA at the mm -hmm. different leadership courses that you visit. You know, what are we expecting brigade, battalion, company level uh, leadership to be doing to help set their soldiers up for success? That's a great question. First and foremost, be patient. We've built time into this so we could train the force over time, okay? So don't teach them things you don't know about yet. We're going to get you the training package. It's coming, and it's not late. It's ahead of schedule because um, the only real population we're going to affect fully this year is the Sergeant Major population, and they are going to be fully trained and educated. Like I said in June, at our annual Senior Enlisted Training Leader Development Conference, every nominative Sergeant Major will be trained by the subject matter experts on every single detail of this and how it will be implemented over the next three years. The graduating class of the United States Army Sergeant Major Academy will also be trained before they graduate and leave this summer. Then we'll issue the training packages to that field and their job is to subsequently train the trainer down through the process. Again, we have plenty of time. If there's questions in the meantime, you can ask um, your personnel managers, but they're not going to affect the population until you've been fully trained, I assure you. Right, Sergeant Major? Absolutely, yes, I mean. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing I would say is, is focus on getting yourself educating, educating your soldiers, educating your leaders who evaluate soldiers so that we understand um, the process that is coming forth. You also can reach out on the Army G1 page. We have frequently asked questions. As we receive questions, we answer them and we post them out there for your edification. And also soon, as the SMA said, we have a training package that we're going to release to the field so that you can conduct professional development sessions in your organizations. Yeah, and I'll t I can't stress enough is if you, the most important part is educating your non-commissioned officers on what the board evaluates. And that is clearly outlined in DA PAM 600-25. For some reason, it's this unknown thing, and it's very clear. It's simple. If you go in there and read it, it's very understandable, and you'll agree with what's in there. It's the standards by which um, each of the proponents has said, this is what's important for that skill level and MOS. Once again, we want to remind the audience to keep submitting your questions, and thank you again for joining us here on Facebook Live. Uh, submit your questions. If we don't get to them in the course of our dialogue here with our panelists, we're going to make sure that we have a crack team of folks answering your questions after we're done well after this broadcast. Next one we have, though, from the field is, will the update affect the DA photo process? That's a great question. Sergeant Major? So the short answer is, is no. So, so that you can understand how the DA photo impacts your actual board process, when a board member is looking at your file, the very first thing that they see is your DA photo. So you want to make sure that you and a squad leader or a supervisor takes the time to ensure that your DA photo is up to date and represents you because this will set the tone of how a board member views your file and the individual that you're representing yourself to be. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't stress enough that uh, there is a different change. In the past, you could decline um, a look for promotion. Mm -hmm. Under this evaluation system, everybody's going to be evaluated. So if you fail to do uh, um, update your photo in accordance with Army regulation, you could be at risk of falling below um, the same level as your peers. This evaluation board could lead to your administrative removal from the Army if you are selected twice um, in two years in a row as being below the standard of your peers. And what I tell you is this requires every non-commissioned officer to do their job, and every non-commissioner's job is to follow the regulation and update their records. Will there be an exception to policy for pregnant soldiers to compete at any NCOES in order to allow them to be competitive? 
We entertain exception policies for promotion all the time. Uh, one one that we have written into the regulation right now is for operation, so Absolutely. we don't so we don't uh, hinder any of those people who are doing what the Army's asked them to do. And uh, chain of commands can submit exception of policy for soldiers. Cool. So you know, following some of the social media posts out there as the stories come out about this process and procedure, and the naysayers out there, there was nothing wrong with the old system. And I, I think if we could just revisit that for a second to address that. Uh, talk about some comparisons, the old system versus the new, why why the old system just really is outdated. Yeah, absolutely. And, it's a, and, I, and you heard me say it, it has served us well for many years. 50 years is a long time. Um, both of us are a product of that promotion system, so we can't talk necessarily bad about it. That doesn't mean we can't improve on it. And we took an opportunity, this opportunity, to do just that. It also, it meets emerging requirements. As we talked before, we used to have to wait till another annual board cycle before we could change the requirements. How often does the Army requirements change? Well, let me tell you, since I've been in the Army of the Army, all the time. We are constantly downsizing the Army, or growing the Army, or adding authorizations, and moving authorizations. And whether you know it or not, that has a direct effect on our ability to promote soldiers on time and meet the demands of the Army. Um, and this is an ever-changing environment that we live in every single day. And the requirements, the four structure requirements for the United States Army change to meet those ever-changing um, requirements giving us the ability to promote as necessary off of a standing evaluation list enables us to meet those emergency requirements on a quarterly basis versus an annual basis as you heard Sergeant Major Clark say earlier under the old system if we didn't promote enough uh, we'd have to wait till the next board cycle and then select more and then what happens if the requirements change during that year then we overpromoted. So to be very honest, what we would do is we would stall the promotion system mm -hmm. um, because we have to promote to the Army's requirements. And we ended up doing this wave of overpromoted, underpromoted, overpromoted, and it frustrates the force. The biggest angst I think that you're going to hear people say is there's, what about predictability? In the past, I used to have a sequence number and I knew I was going to get promoted. But I can tell you, if you're doing what the Army needs you to do, all right, the promotion allocations are going to be the same as they were in the past but it's gonna reward those people who are doing what the Army needs them to do. We're gonna be able to skip the people who don't go, choose to go to school for their own reasons, all right? We're not gonna hold it against anybody for something they didn't do wrong, okay? But there's a lot of people throughout the year that because of themselves don't go to school, and we can skip over those individuals and give that promotion authorization to a deserving non-commissioned officer. That's gonna help us get farther down that list. If the, if the requirements change in the, in the annual cycle, we don't have to wait for the next board cycle. We can say, I need six or 10 or 12 or maybe 100 more allocations for Absolutely. a specific MOS. Sorry, Major. Absolutely. And to further echo what the SMA is saying, with our current process that we have now, when we release a promotion list, we, the Army, have committed to promoting you. And as requirements change over the years, we may not actually need those promotion uh, in that MOS by the time we're actually promoting you, but we may need them in another MOS. And so the new process gives us the flexibility to promote where we need the requirements and to make sure that we aren't over promoting where we don't need it and that we can make up the shortages where we're hurting in the other MOSs. And I think the biggest change, I think, and a lot of senior non-commissioned officers would attest to it is, you're working hard, you're doing exactly what the Army's asked you to do. You met the requirements to compete for promotion, but you have to wait um, in front of everybody else who may have not been as talented as you, who may have not been hard working as you, have may not see the valuations as high as you. You have to wait for them to get promoted based upon time. Time is not the primary factor that determines talent. It is a factor that helps determine whether or not you have a level of experience. But that experience sometimes is good and sometimes is bad. This rewards exactly what we should be rewarding, performance and potential. Two-part question for you. Part one, how will this affect the MOSs in high demand for NCO versus smaller MOSs uh, or MOSs that are over strength? And how does this affect those that are constantly deploying? Because you mentioned going to school, they may not have that opportunity since they're in a, in a high op tempo. Absolutely, and I'll, I'll, I'll address the deployment in Sergeant Major. I'll let you talk about the, the, the high <coughs> demand and low demand MOSs. First and foremost, we have built into the process a waiver. So if you're doing what the Army's asking you to do, all your chain of command has to do is submit a waiver and we can promote you. So if you're deployed or there's an operational requirement. Now, the regulation is written and I assure you that the first and foremost, you should go to school. I've told leadership all the time, if there's an opportunity, even if the unit is deployed, to send that non-commissioned officer back to go to school, that's what you should do. And we've enabled that by putting schools in places like Kuwait and we do MTTs in the Horn of Africa and other locations. 
And even in Afghanistan in recent years, we've done some MTTs mm -hmm. because we got to train you. We got to train you to be able to do your job and lead your soldiers, and that's first and foremost. But the system is designed to not hurt soldiers who are doing exactly what the Army needs them to do. But uh, looking at the numbers, I'll tell you, every quarter I review the number of those non-commissioned officers and the reasons why they have not gone to school. The lowest number is operational needs. The highest number is individual requirements. So we still have to fix ourselves. Operational uh, requirements we will compensate for, but I need non-commissioned officers to do the things that the Army asked them to do, get to school so they can become fully eligible. Sorry, mate. So to address high demand and low demand M uh, MOSs, for the high demand MOSs that are very hard to retain, um, soldiers who are performing well, who are ranked the best qualified on their OML in those high demand MOSs may be selected for continuous service beyond their RCP because we need them and they are actually doing the great work that we need them to do. For those that are in low demand MOSs, if you are a fully qualified non-commissioned officer towards the bottom of your OML list, we will offer you the opportunity to reclassify into a understrength MOS because you are still doing what the Army is asking you to do and you want to serve, so we will give you other opportunities to serve in a different MOS. Yeah, so this really helps us balance the force. And Sergeant Major Clark made an appointment uh, um, message there about RCPs. Retention control points, which is a time-based system, is what we use to help us manage the strength of a force. So we have a, a mandatory time you can serve as a Sergeant First Class, a Master Sergeant, a Sergeant Major. And sometimes uh, that serves the needs of the Army, and sometimes it hurts the individual. You have some fully qualified, high-performing non-commissioned officers that still have a lot to give to the Army, um, but we can't retain them because of RCPs. This system allows us to get away from that because it rewards talent, and it retains talent. We can use talent as a means as retention and force management because we do have to tell people it's time to go home as well, and we should, right, and not time. And it rewards those individuals who are continuing to sprint at the finish. So will NCOES school seats be increased, and will the Guard and Reserve soldiers get equal preference for those? Well, they've all, we have always uh, given uh, equal preference to Guard and Reserve. As a matter of fact, a multitude of our non-commissioned officer education and professional development system seats come from our Compo 2 and 3 schools. We have what is called the One Army School System. Mm -hmm. The One Army School System is in full effect, and all training uh, non-commissioned officers out there in units have what is called the Common Operation Picture for the One Army School System. So they can see available training seats. If a designated unit who's designated for those training seats has not secured them within 90 days, they can go in there and then secure those non-commissioned officer training seats for their unit. Well, that's been going on for some years. There's a little myth about not having enough training seats out there. I can assure you that we meet the demands of the requirements of the Army each year. And we, throughout the year, we do what is called a trap system. I'll let Sergeant Major Clark uh, uh, describe the details of it. But basically, um, sometimes we don't get the number right. Or, as I talked before, the requirements change throughout the year. Well, we have a mechanism in place that allows us to adjust that. Sergeant Major? So as the SMA said, we currently have the capacity to train the requirements that we need for uh, soldiers to get promoted. However, sometimes individuals don't go to school, and that's a school seat uh, of an individual who could have been trained that, that doesn't get trained. And so what happens when we have additional training requirements based on what we didn't project for, we have to do what's called a trap process where we resource for additional uh, instructors, for, so that we can do additional classes and ensure that individuals get trained. So how does this affect soldiers who are on permanent profile? Well, that depends. Every profile is specific. What I tell you is that if you can meet the demands of your MOS and skill level, um, then it should have minimal effect. Um, but if you can't, as you know, we just updated policy just a short while ago about being deployable. Um, there's a requirement for you to be deployable as a soldier, and there should be a requirement for you to be deployable as a soldier. So it depends on the profile, um, but I will tell you is you need to meet the demands of your MOS. So in short, I would tell you the, the policies associated with profiles that impact your ability to train are still in effect. There are no changes associated with those policies. That's right. Well, as we mentioned qualifications, uh, the term fully qualified is throughout this new directive. Can you give some examples of what a fully qualified NCO looks like from the board's perspective? Yeah. Sorry, so. When board members vote your file, they vote from a one minus all the way through a six plus. On average, if a soldier has a three minus or above, they are considered what is fully, fully considered fully qualified. If your score comes up to a two or below, you are considered what's uh, considered not fully qualified. So we will use the not fully qualified 
individuals who receive a two or a one, and we will send you a notification to let you know that the board has found you not fully qualified, and if your service does not, or your performance does not improve, that your service could be at risk. If a soldier is a three or above, this means that you are fully qualified for promotion if requirements are available, which means, for example, the 2018 Sergeant First Class list for 42 Alphas, we had a 96% uh, selection rate which means we selected everyone who was fully qualified because those were the requirements that we had for that MOS for that year. So like we mentioned earlier, what if I found un unqualified on the first board, you send me a notice, tell me, put me on notice saying, hey, I need to do something different than what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. On the second board, I come on fully qualified, then what happens? So on the first time that you're found not fully qualified, you will receive a headquarters DA uh, bar to continue service. You will have 12 months to overcome that bar. If you receive a second, uh, fully, uh, not fully qualified for the, the board, then you will be separated from service. Okay. And that's where we can add that promotion allocation to the next year's um, evaluation board, right? Absolutely. That's good. Okay. Well, how about those with special duties? Uh, will, will they continue to outweigh others, such as drill sergeant, over recruiting duty? Question from the field. Yeah, and I get this question all the time. What I tell you is go back to DA PAM 600-25. So it depends on your MOS. What I tell you is it will clearly outline, for example, I was a young 11 Mike and then 11 Bravo. And if you look in there, it'll say you should serve as a squad leader first. And then a broadening opportunity as a drill sergeant or recruiter will look, be looked upon favorably. So it depends. It depends where you are um, in your professional development model. Uh, depends on your skill level. Um, and it depends on the specific MOS. Sorry, Manu. And I would tell you from my experience of sitting on the board, mm -hmm. it's, it's not just whether you're a recruiter or whether you're a drill sergeant, it's how you perform right. in those positions. So I want you to understand that just serving in a position does not guarantee you a promotion. It will help make you competitive with your peers, but it's determined on how you perform when you're in those positions. But if you are unsure whether you should do recruiting or whether you should do drill sergeant, I must echo what the SMA said. Refer to DAPAM 600-25. It will outline it for your MOS, what jobs that you should hold at each grade. Absolutely. Well, something you just said there kind of <clears throat> sparked something I'd like to ask Sergeant Major Clark. And going back to the, you know, what defines a fully qualified soldier, and you've linked that to performance, can you get a little more specific and talk about, you know, what would happen or what would cause a soldier to be not fully qualified? Yeah, let, me, uh, let me two? tell you what I've observed. It's just to ease some of the angst out there, okay? If you're coming to work and doing your job every day and performing at a level that's commensurate of your peers, you're going to be fully qualified. You have to earn a one or a two evaluation by a board member. And I'm telling you, this is a person that's set on many boards, okay? And what are some examples of a, an unqualified failure to meet height and weight, failure to pass an APFT, um, did something derogatory, got a DUI, okay? Uh, had an EO violation or a SHARP violation. They received a well below the standard of evaluation on their non-commissioned officer evaluation board, or four or five, right? Um, <coughs> recommended by the chain of command um, to not be promoted or continue in service. You have a bar, you have a flag, all these kind of, you're non-deployable. Okay, these are all the things that um, clearly make you unqualified. Right, Sherman? Cool. You hit it right on the head, SMA. Mm -hmm. Will the revisions affect how and when fully qualified sergeants first class are frocked to first sergeant positions? Well, let me clarify something about frocking. Frocking is based upon an authorization, okay? So <clears throat> it won't change. If you are within a certain time period of taking over an authorized first sergeant position, then the chain of command is author is, 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 can frock you if you're in a status, right, Sergeant? Cool. So we intend to look at revising the regulation as it pertains to frocking because mm -hmm. one, the concept of promotable will go away because there's no longer a promotion list that is released saying that you are promotable. So with that concept going away, we expect leaders to find first and foremost the most fully qualified master sergeant to serve in those first sergeant positions mm -hmm. because the analysis that we've done here shows that we have way too many sergeant first classes serving as first sergeants than master sergeants which is what we do the requirements based on to fill those first sergeant positions. Absolutely, but Sergeant Major's right. We have to look at the language because <coughs> there's still going to be those opportunities where you have somebody that's fully eligible, they've been evaluated, they're high on the list, they've been to requisite level school, they're full, full eligible for promotion. So we'll get back to you on some language change on that. Um, but, of course, if, if we need to, first and foremost, we need to find fully qualified mass sergeants to fill those first sergeant cool. positions. But we will make sure there's an opportunity um, so that's clearly understood by the force when that takes an effect.
Yeah. All right, next question that we've gotten from the field. How does the OML work when you've already attended SLC ML? So we may have already covered it, but they might have just tuned in. Yeah, that's great news. And in the future, a lot of those people will have because we're going to train ahead. The, the intent of this system is to, to get rid of the backlog. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, if you're fully qualified right, and you're high enough on the OML, the evaluation list, and the Army has a requirement for promotion, we're going to be offering it to you. That's the great news. So if you're trained ahead, good on you. That's it right there. Mm -hmm. Now, Sergeant Major Clark, I know that your office puts out the board instructions. Uh, could you give us a rundown of how that's going to play out as far as announcing each board, what types of instructions will you issue, and uh, what do soldiers need to do if they have questions? Okay, so with the current process, we normally announce the board 120 days out, giving soldiers the opportunity to update their records and validate them before they go to the board. With the new NCO evaluation board process, we intend to add a 60-day window on the back end of the 120 days that we're giving soldiers to update their records because we want commands to have an opportunity to also validate those records saying that those individual soldiers are fully qualified and eligible for promotion. Yeah, and this is every single non-commissioned officer in that skill level and grade, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, gentlemen, I see that the uh, the questions are starting to slow up a little bit and I've exhausted my, my round of questions that I had uh, prepped for you. So uh, why don't we start with some closing comments, uh, Sergeant Major? Absolutely. First and foremost, I got to thank the team here in the, in the Army G1. They've done phenomenal work and the DA Secretariat. This isn't something that we thought up overnight or something we did in haste. Several years of analysis have gone on to this, synchronizing this with our current promotion system, uh, making sure that it's going to be lockstep with the changes we're going to make in the future with things like IPSA A and the changes we already made with STEP making sure we can first and foremost meet the necessary requirements of the Army. Um, nothing is ever going to be perfect, but we are closer to where we were before, I assure you. Having been intimately involved in this process for the last two years and have included all the senior representatives of each of the major commands throughout the Army through the entire process with frequent updates on a quarterly basis of the progress and where we were headed, I have their 100% concurrence that this was the right thing to do. Last year, we presented this to the Senior Enlisted Training and Leader Conference, over 200 nominative level SAR majors. Every single one of them said, this is the direction we need to go for the future of our NCO Corps. What I'd ask you is be patient. We owe you more information and more training to sh make sure that you're fully informed on this. Of course, um, send us your questions. If you have concerns and questions, we need to answer them. It's our responsibility. And it's our responsibility to train you and so you can turn around and train your soldiers. Help me dispel the myths. Help me dispel um, the things that people don't even know about yet. We're going to get you the information. We're going to arm you with the appropriate information so you can then arm your soldiers. But keep the questions coming, and the more questions we send in, we'll follow up with another event like this, and we'll answer them as soon as they get here. So thanks for what you're doing. I promise you that the team here has done a phenomenal job of designing a system that's going to take us well into the future and remain the best non-commissioned officer corps this world has ever seen. Cool. Sergeant Major Clark, any final words? So I would just ask the field to continue mm -hmm. trying to educate yourselves on this new process. A lot of culture changes that are going to change how we do business. As the SMA said, please keep sending us your questions. We want to make sure that we have dotted the I's and crossed the T's on everything to ensure that this system is the best for the individual soldiers and the Army as well. All right, Sergeant Major Mark Clark, the G1 DMPM Sergeant Major, and of course, Sergeant Major of the Army SMA, Dan Daly. From all of us here at the Pentagon and the Army G1, I'm Hank Manitrez. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for watching. Yeah, thank you.